Well, good morning. Again, my name is Keith Hubble. I'm an engineering consultant with TMS Group. And let me start by saying it's a joy and a pleasure to be back in Gothenburg. So when I was here two years ago, um, I had a chance to talk with a lot of operators on different vessels. Um, and one of the themes that I noticed that was recurring is that when these activities were looking to purchase new boats, they didn't feel that they had an objective means to be able to do a comparison between these boats or the human systems that are on them. So my, my hope is that by the end of this conversation that you see that there are some tools available out there in the marketplace. So a quick overview of the presentation. Um, we're going to look at some statistics that are coming out of the special operations community. Um, then we're going to look at the anatomy of a wave impact. And then for the majority of the presentation, we're going to focus on inertial measurement units and how they can be used in various applications like hull performance and side-by-side -side testing, human biomechanics analysis, uh, dynamic digital uh, twins. Um, so that's a, that's a product that we've been working on to fully define all the events going on from the boat to the seat to the human. So a little bit about the problem. You've heard a lot about it over the past two days. Um, so this is a medical report that's provided to members of group four, uh, basically characterizing the kind of exposure they'll see in special boat operations. Uh, so the current trends are showing that nearly 100% um, of this community of people are getting hurt. This is six times the general population. It's reported that cervical or neck impact ranges on high-speed assault and combatant craft range from 2 to 125 Gs. And then number three, mathematical models show that forces applied to the pelvic region by the time they transfer up to the head can be magnified up to five times. So five G impulse at the pelvic, 25 Gs at the head. Let's switch gears and look at the anatomy of a wave impact. So here we have kind of a very typical um, pulse. Uh, we have Cs that are one meter and a vessel doing about 35 knots. Uh, bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a triaxial graph showing X, Y, and Z of the hull input. That hull input is coming from a sensor mounted at the base of the seat. And then the operator sitting on top of the shock-mitigated seat has a triaxial accelerometer on their right hip. So let's look at vertical first. Um, the hull received an 8.6 G uh, impact and the body 5 Gs. So here, the seat's doing exactly what we would expect it to do, is to mitigate vertical shock, a reduction of about 40%. How about lateral? Uh, the hull received 2.7 Gs, uh, the body 1.8. Again, kind of exactly what we would expect from a seat that mitigates lateral shock, 30% reduction. How about in the four-aft direction? The hull, 2.3 Gs, but yet the body saw 4.7. What happened here? Why did we get a magnification of times two? Well, unfortunately, we, we, we don't know. We don't have enough data to really analyze and understand what's going on during this event. Maybe the operator's seat belt wasn't on and their body went into motion and came in contact with the console. We just don't know. So waves produce stochastic or somewhat unpredictable forces. Um, seldom does anything move in a pure planar motion. Therefore, uh, for more in-depth analysis and design, we need to measure in six degrees of freedom, um, X, Y, and Z, and rotations about all three of those axes. So we can do that with IMUs. Um, today's IMUs are pretty impressive. They can wirelessly transmit high rates of data, including accelerations up to 200 Gs at 1600 Hertz sampling rates. Uh, they can measure rotations, position, temperature, humidity, GPS location, speed, uh, electromyography, all while being packaged in an IP67 sensor with the ability to run four hours plus. Now let's take those, those IMUs and let's do a study of two boats side by side. So earlier this year in January, uh, we had the opportunity to do just that off of the coast of Norfolk. Um, we had two boats. Uh, the first boat was a standard U.S. Navy rib boat uh, manu manufactured by USMI. The second boat is a Raffner rib boat manufactured out of Reykjavik, Iceland. Both boats have almost the identical length and beam. Um, the Navy boat weighed about 18,000 pounds. The Raffner boat, 9,000. So a doubling in, in, si uh, in, in mass. Um, the hull type on the Navy boat was a traditional deep V fiberglass hull. Uh, the hull type on the Raffner boat uses the OK hull. It's a hybrid hull. It has a semi-displacement hull in the front and a, and a 
deep V in the back. It is also fiberglass. The propulsion on the Navy boat was inboards with water jets, and then we had outboard gasoline engines on the Raffner boat. So before we get into the data, a little bit about data interpretation. It's important to note that this is not a perfect apples to apples comparison. Um, it seldom is. Um, so three things I want to highlight. The LCG of the Navy boat was unknown, so we couldn't really compare those. Um, the Navy boat had two times the displacement of the Raffner boat, and so that's a significant advantage uh, for the Navy boat in terms of accelerations. The Raffner boat's IMU was one meter closer to the transom, which is a slight advantage for the Raffner boat. But it's believed that the overall advantage is on the side of the Navy boat. So keep these in mind as we go through this. So this is the test patterns that we run. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a standard Navy practice. Side-by-side um, -side testing, by both boats running 30 knots, the same direction at the same time. Uh, the, the waves on this particular day were about one meter. You can see the direction of the waves, and then we ran a cloverleaf pattern five ways to the seas. So a little, bit how to, a little bit about how to read these graphs. Um, so the x-axis on both of those is time, and it's always um, scaled the same. The y-axis is going to be whatever we're talking about for that particular graph, and they, that, too, uh, is on the same scaling. Um, so you can visually compare these traces. Um, the Raffner data is always going to be on the top. Uh, the Navy boat is always going to be on the bottom. And then you'll see um, this yellow box uh, kind of bounds the average um, data values that we see, and then the pink box here uh, bounds kind of the transients. And so we'll talk about average and transients as we go through. So um, angular velocity uh, in the pitch direction. So what this is measuring is from bow to stern. Uh, this, is, this is the amount of pitch, the, the angular velocity in degrees per second that the bow is pitching up every time it encounters a wave. Uh, and what we see here is that the Navy boat had two and a half to five and a half times greater angular velocity compared to the Raffner boat. Uh, we had a boat stationed at the center of the clover leaf uh, that was observing both of these boats during the operation. And as soon as the exercise was over, I asked the crew, what did you observe between the two boats? And immediately they said that the Navy boat was porpoising through the water significantly where the Raffner boat had a little bit of pitch, but it was staying on top of the waves. And so they could see this visually, and the data supports it. Um, how about in the vertical acceleration? Um, 1.7 times greater than the Raffner boat. That's significant, 70% more accelerations. How about in the uh, four-aft direction? This is a little bit surprising. Um, two and a half to three and a half times greater accelerations in the forward to back direction. Um, lateral accelerations, 1.6 to 2.1 times greater than the Raffner boat. I'm sorry, than, than the, um, yeah, than the Raffner boat. Um, so here's a summary of, of all of that data. Um, given that all of the parameters that we measured were greater and the Navy boat, we could normalize that to the Raffner hull. Uh, so all the values are 1.0 for, for the Raffner hull. And then kind of a recap, we see that five and a half times greater uh, in the pitch direction, um, the accelerations, you know, if we want to protect operators, the number one thing we can do is to mitigate those forces at the source through the hull. That just means there's going to be less energy for the seats to dampen out. And one of the things I want to point out here is, remember yesterday when we were watching the video uh, that Dr. Ullman played where they had the operator and he came down and his neck just crunched really hard? I think you see part of the reason why that is. You know, during the shock events, not only do we have a, um, a vertical force, but we also have a fore-aft force. And I think those two combined and rotations are causing the spine and the head to whip in a really significant direction. I think you see that here in the data. Um, so roll and pitch, we see a 50% increase on the Navy boat relative to Raffner. And so um, that, that's going to be a safer ride for the crew. Uh, less rotation during a shock event, I think, is going to be better for the spine. So... Let's take it to the next level. Uh, let's put more IMUs on the boat, uh, and then we can begin to build a dynamic digital twin of all of the dy dynamic events going on. 
So this is an overview of the software uh, that we're using. In the top here, we see a digital twin. So this is a full three-dimensional model uh, that moves in real time, and we can play it back. Um, in the center there, we have the ability to integrate up to I 18 IMUs, uh, all of those IMUs producing any of the data that we talked about before. Uh, so we can pull those traces up, isolate them, compare them to the human body. And then down in the bottom, we see a human um, biomechanic uh, data panel. And so there we can isolate different movements for the avatar that you're getting ready to see. So this was, um, uh, we just started recording some of these events about two or three weeks ago. Uh, we were at Trident Spectre, a couple miles off the coast of Norfolk. We were in four to five foot seas. And so what you're getting ready to see is a, is a real-time video that I was watching on my laptop as we were collecting data. Um, and so as that, when I hit the play button, you're going to see we're getting ready to start a calibration. So we'll go ahead and hit play. Uh, you see the user standing up. Uh, he's going through a calibration right now. As soon as the system is calibrated, you can already see the boat's motion. Uh, he sits down at the helm, grabbing the throttle, um, and we're taking off. You're starting to see we're coming up on step. The bow is pitching up exactly as you would expect. Um, and so you notice also I just zoomed out. I have the ability to, to zoom in real time, look at different angles, um, flip the boat over. Now we can see a top-down view of what's going on. Um, and now I'm getting ready to flip the boat so we can get a port side view. Keep in mind, this, this model of this boat is just some free source that we downloaded. Um, and so we've got some graphical things to work through. You see the hands kind of disappear in the console. But, but that avatar, uh, we are collecting the entire human skeletal structure. Um, so we, ha we have all that data. And so in the future, we might want to be able to turn the boat off so you can see exactly what's going on with the user, spin around and see different angles. So how did we collect that data? Um, we have 12 IMUs on the person, uh, three IMUs on the left arm, three on the right arm, one on each leg, and then four from the spine all the way at the base of the spine all the way to the head. We also have a whole sensor at the base of the seats installed on the track, and that's what's driving the six degrees of freedom for the boat itself. So one of the things I want to highlight here is now that we have all this data available to us, we can do real-time biofeedback. And so what I'm getting ready to demonstrate is an alarm that's get, that gets triggered in real time off of the operator. Top left-hand um, graph is showing the vertical acceleration of the boat, just so we can kind of ground what's going on at the hull. Um, right side top, that's going to be an animated video showing the avatar actually responding in real time. The bottom panel is going to be what I've highlighted here is just neck rotation in this direction. I mean, we could measure all three directions if we wanted to, but I'll, for demonstration, I want to show uh, head rotation in this direction. And specifically, I've written a rule so that when the head gets to a 40 degree position, it'll trigger an alarm. You'll hear the alarm and you'll be able to see the head actually corresponding to that. So let's go ahead and play this. Um, so it's going to happen. Did you hear that alarm? It's going to happen twice. It's getting ready to happen again. Watch the head in, in the upper right-hand corner. Watch. So correlation between body position. So imagine what you could do with this. Um, now you'd have the ability to write several rules to monitor all of the body positions. And as Ron was talking about, you know, the operator wants to be in neutral spine. Well, maybe you write a rule set that says if, if you get more than 10 or 20 degrees outside of neutral spine in any of the body postures, um, maybe you have an event that's going to that's gonna trigger. Uh, maybe you have a light on a dash. Maybe you want to tie that to throttles on the boat. Um, so that's kind of where we are today. We're still in development. It's pretty early. Um, but in terms of some of the things we want to do in the future, um, one of the things we'd like to do is add the seat into the model. Today, the seat is not a six degree of freedom uh, moving item. But if you look at the energy on, on the left here, uh, if you look at the, um, the way that the energy moves from the waves to the human, um, the wave is imparted on the boat, and the boat moves in six degrees of freedom. And then you have a seat that's on top of that, and that seat moves in six degrees of freedom. And then you have a, a person that sits on that seat. And so we want to model all of those events, all the way from the um, wave to the, everything that's happening with the human body. So um, adding a sensor on the seat would give us that ability. We also know um, that the position of the legs, whether you're standing or sitting, is pretty important to understanding the shock event. So we want to add two more sensors, one below the knees, so we can get the angle of the, of the leg there. And then it would be nice to also have ex um, IMUs both at the bow and the stern, and then we would be able to characterize the accelerations over the entire boat. 
So what are some of the use cases uh, for something like this? Um, certainly for whole performance, um, we can do CFD verification, uh, validate what the models showed and take the, the, the gap and put those back into the CFD to make that model more accurate. Um, we can measure bow rise over the entire speed range. This is really important. Um, several boats have a bow rise that's so high that you can't even see the sea in front of you uh, when you're operating that boat. And so uh, measuring that would be a good characterization in a down select scenario. Uh, measuring roll and pitch stability of a hull. Uh, wave impact exposure characterization, side-by-side uh, -side testing and down select. You've already seen an example of that. Um, if you were a procurement activity, which one of those boats would you want to be on? Um, trim tab performance and optimization. How about human systems design and ergonomics? Um, this gives you a real-time feedback system to understand how well are your human systems and interfaces uh, working for the person. How about operator training? Uh, Real-time operator training that shows them what right posture looks like. Um, you can have the best hull in the world, you can have the best seats in the world, but if your posture is wrong, it could be the difference as to whether you are carried off at the end of the mission or you walk off at the end of the mission. So training them what right looks and feels like. Uh, and then finally, you've already mentioned it, safe boat operations. Maybe this system is tied to um, the throttles or a kill switch on the boat. These are the use cases that, that, um, that we can think of. Certainly would be interested in any use cases that, that you might see for a technology like this. Um, and so with that, this is my contact information. Uh, feel free to take a picture of the screen um, and I'll take questions.